talent, um, especially when it comes to the cloud and big data. Highly qualified people definitely have their pick of the jobs today. As we heard earlier this week, it is a worker's job market right now. Companies, on the other hand, no longer have large pools of applicants to choose from, and that means changing where they look for the right people. Well, we've assembled a panel today of companies to tell us about what the world of social recruiting is like today. And I think this is going to be a really interesting um, conversation to find out how you can use social media to find the right fit for your company. Please help me welcome our panelists. Hello. Hello, welcome. Thank Hello, you. good to see you. Welcome. You, you guys are here to help us find a job. Please take a seat. <laughs> Let's um, I'll just go through and introduce everyone here so that we all know who is who. Next to me is Chetel Olson. Did I get that right? That is correct. Okay. Vice President in Europe of Elance. Do you say Elance or Elance? Elance. Elance. In the American right. way. Yeah, in the American way. Okay. Um, and next to him is Jana Egerding, the Senior Vice President of Corporate HR at ISTA. Um, and next to her, Mr. Gleiman, correct? Christian Gleiman, the HR Director with Eon IT, and next to him, Georg Goller, the Area VP General Manager Central Europe with Success Factors, and that is an SAP company. Yes. So, welcome to all four of you. Where are all the talented people today? We have heard all this week that there's a shortage, companies can't find them. Do you know where to find them? I start with you here, Chester. Where, where are the right people? So I think the right people are probably everywhere. Um, just have to look carefully for them. Um, what we in Elon, so sorry for kind of uh, not, I'm not trying to make this as a commercial for Elon. Yeah, go ahead, it's okay. What, what we see is that talents are not necessarily very close to you. There are talents residing all across the world. And that's what our company tried to, to do is really to match the talents and the businesses regardless of where in the world they live. And you, and let's just tell a little bit about what you do. You are an online marketplace for freelancers, right? Yeah, so Elon is an online marketplace for freelancers. So we actually call it workplace, uh, work platform. So we have 2.3 million freelancers residing all across the world, and we have around about a half a million businesses that are looking for freelance talents through our platform. Um, and in our world, it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter who you know, it's all about what you do and how good you are. Um, so we see that uh, for a lot of businesses out there, especially now in Europe where it's growing exceptionally fast, is that they free themselves from the limitation of the local employment market and start looking for talent all across the world. Because there are talented PHP developers and graphic designers and SEO marketeers, not necessarily locally, but they all reside also uh, on the online work platforms like Elans. Okay. Jana, what about you? Where, where are you finding the right people? I mean, currently we find the right people within the organization. Mm. Luckily, we have four and a half thousand talents, so to say. Um, but yes, you're right. I think there is a shortage and um, we try to overcome that challenge by various measures. And uh, it starts with recruitment and we find our talents not only in local um, countries and situations, but also abroad. And uh, I think that's also a challenge we are facing. And also, let's just tell people what um, ISTA International does. You're a service provider for utility billing and energy use analysis, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. That's an IT basis, uh, IT based services in the area of energy efficiency. So, with the service we contribute, we reduce carbon footprint. Um, this is the business we are in. And uh, okay. we have entities in 25 countries. And uh, that makes us a pretty international, a truly international company, even though we are a medium-sized entity with four and a half thousand employees. Okay. Christian, what about you guys at Eon? Yeah, well, if I look at Eon IT, um, I'm heading up HR for Eon IT. We are an IT service provider with um, subsidiaries in 10 countries. And so we take a global stance when we look at recruiting talent. Um, so that's predominantly in Europe. And um, we try to go where the talents are, and so we can uh, flex our workforce between uh, countries. However, if I look at it from an EON point of view in the utility sector, we certainly um, have to be 
uh, I have to take a local um, look. Uh, for example, if we do have to run power plants, yeah, we can't go for talents um, someplace else. We need to find them in the local communities, and so there are different approaches depending on what kind of skills you're looking for. It can be global, but sometimes it needs to be local as well. Okay, Georg? I think uh, my colleagues here covered, um, covered it pretty nicely so far. Um, when it comes to where are the talents, I only want to add that um, it starts with the people who are employed already. So uh, one of our flagship customers, Siemens, for instance, when they implemented our solution, um, especially the recruiter said, what a beautiful solution. We added 400,000 talents to our system. Um, and that is something uh, which sometimes uh, is not seen very well. Right? And only if you can find your talent and you do not do your career planning, succession management um, successfully, then it sometimes has an impact to turnover um, and fluctuations of people leaving the company uh, bigger time than they should do or than it should be. And then you need to recruit externally. Wait yeah, um, is social media the <coughs> a gold mine? Um, for people in HR, people, if, when you're looking for talent, I mean, we hear that social media is where you're going to find the right people. Is that true or is there a lot of hype there? Who wants to set? Jana? Um, well, I think social media offers in general a great opportunity because it's, I see it as an open marketplace. But it has also its threats or challenges because as it is so open, um, it's difficult to tighten um, the strategy and how to communicate with people directly and build up a dialogue is, is, I mean, needs also a lot of resources to fill the communication in an authentic way. Um, so I think social media in general offers the opportunity to overcome the shortage, but I think in general it's a bundle of different measures you have to take into consideration. Recruiting online, active sourcing is definitely one part, mm -hmm. but maybe not the most important one. Yeah. Can I just comment on one thing there? So what, what I see, so if you look at social media um, and I kind of add on um, job boards and other methods for finding talents, uh, it doesn't really kind of solve the talent shortage mm. because it's kind of still all employers are fishing in the same pond. Sure. Yeah. So I think that's the main challenge of today's recruiting market and the talent uh, shortage that we have. We need to look at things in a different way. We need to find other methods, other places to, to tap into talents from. Uh, I don't think social media will solve that because everybody else is doing that. Sure. And it's what, just what are the, one additional media challenge to mm -hmm. reach them. What would you say the other places are then? Because I think a, a lot of employers, if, if, if you talk to them, uh, a lot of uh, top managers, CEOs, when you talk to them, they think the other places are social media sites. Yeah, and as I said, I think it's just more that's another media. Um, in a, it's kind of you don't create more candidates out of social media. It just kind of exposes you to, to more and other candidates. So what what I'm um, what I would say it would be one of the solution is that companies are looking into various sorts of employment models. Do people need to be fully employed, or could you actually have freelancers? in your organization. In case you have freelancer, how would you have to rig your organization? In Elans, we talk about the hybrid, uh, hybrid organization model, a model where you actually combine on-site and online staff, uh, where the online part, it really doesn't matter where they lo uh, they're located. It just matters what they can do, and they're actually avail uh, available for your company and actually mm -hmm. meet your talent need. You, um, I have to ask you this, we've been talking about this today and yesterday. Um, you championed freelancing, you championed getting rid of the geography that is tied yeah. to yeah. working, right? Yeah. Not all of it, of course, because as, as one of you guys correctly said, some positions, some jobs need to be, form, be, form, be performed locally. But there are a lot of jobs that actually can be form, be form, performed remotely. What about the notion of getting rid of home office, you know? Everyone's been talking this week about Yahoo's decision to, to get rid of um, home office. I mean, you would die if you had to work at Yahoo, wouldn't you? I actually work from an office, but I also work on the road and I'm also working from home. And, 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 and I think that it's, it's a little bit about the company. Uh, can they actually accommodate a work from home uh, model? It's also a matter of what kind of positions do you have. But uh, looking into some of the statistics that we have in Elans, we see that uh, I think it's 79% of the freelancers that we surveyed over the last year that says that they work, they're more productive working from home 
or outside the office. Do you, do you guys agree with that? Are, well, your, are your most productive workers the ones who are not in the office? Um, no, not necessarily. It, it depends, depends certainly on the kind of job they do. However, I think it's a quite important um, factor in decision making by prospect employees how flexible yeah. you mm -hmm. are as a company. And um, we, um, particularly in Eon IT, we, we offer flexible working models, we offer working from home, but it needs to be a good balance, well, I balance. think, between I totally being agree. in the office, yeah, being part of the community of your workforce, connecting with your co-workers and working away from the office from home. And if you strike a good balance that matches the needs of the company and also of the employees, childcare arrangements, etc., mm -hmm. I think that's when you benefit on both sides. Georg, you agree I, with that? I, I think it depends uh, at the end. I mean, you, see, you can have a lot of blue-collar workers who need to go and work in a plant and then there's no way to work from, from home office or in a power plant, whatever uh, you have, you can have. Um, for success factors and for the team who works for me, I mean, we are a 100% cloud company. We work only from home office or from remote and um, sometimes we go to SAP offices or to our own offices and that's up to the, up to the employee, whatever makes sense for him. We trust the employees very much, um, but it has to do also with the culture and the jobs you're offering. Um, so it depends, I think. Jana, what were you going to say? I pretty much agree. Um, I think both aspects are truly and relevant. Um, what percentage, Jana, do you, does your company, I mean, do you, most of your people work in the office? or? Well, or most, most of them they do, yeah. um, but of course our developers, um, they tend to do their coding also from home or remote or while traveling or so. But I think we are a service company, so service means always interaction with customers, whether it's internal or external. Yeah. So to a certain extent, it's also important that, I mean, they cooperate on a, I mean, personal basis. And uh, so it always depends as both of yeah. you guys said. And yeah, with, with modern communication, I mean, I personally work from everywhere, right? If I'm traveling, <laughs> I'm working, I work from home, I work in the office. What about the type of workers that you're going to find uh, on social media? I mean, you, you mentioned yeah. blue-collar workers. I think the, 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 you know, the traditional school of thought is that blue-collar workers are not going to be looking for jobs on social media, that you're going to have a certain skill level automatically when we're talking about social media. Would you guys agree? No, I, I, I would certainly disagree. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, but let's, let's have a look at Germany. 20 million users on Facebook, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. I would say that's a very good um, cross-section of our society. And so you would find basically everyone with every educational background, uh, etc., on Facebook. And now it would depend on how you approach um, those people. And it's not that people necessarily join Facebook in order to find a new job but they are present and so it's for you as an employer to approach these people and to engage in, um, in conversations and maybe that will lead um, further down the line to um, you recruiting someone. Um, so I think it provides tremendous opportunities, but it's almost a foundation by entering a dialogue, by um, creating an ongoing um, relationship um, almost between a company and prospect um, employees and many people may not be interested but some may and but that's Christian, when do you, do you, is that realistic though are you going to go online use social media to find someone to work in a bakery I mean is that where people are going to be who are uh, as, you know let's say someone starting out as as a baker you know let's <coughs> say in Germany like in you know an Atsubi you know, looking mm -hmm. to get experience. Um, are you going to find those types of workers in social media? Let's say you had difficulties in finding people um, wanting to take on this job because um, they think it's horrible working times, yeah? I, I have to uh, work all night. So um, you go and join that insomnia um, um, site on Facebook, yeah? Where people um, who, who, who tend to sleep during the day and work yeah. at nights, um, they discuss. So maybe you find someone there. And you find them there. I, I think no. it depends and it has not only always to do with is active recruiting yeah. so employer branding is probably also something where you might try to create awareness at least mm. yeah that could be a step before it comes to recruiting okay 
But coming back to your question, I think and I strongly believe that uh, the young generation, I mean, they, they, uh, they were grown up with social media, so mm -hmm. you at least find them, also the apprentices, the mm -hmm. potentials, you at least find them somewhere in the web. But the question is, is Facebook a good environment to actively source in a professional is environment? It? Well, I think um, we are not yet there. My personal experience is that um, on Facebook, that's a kind of private network still. Mm -hmm. And much more promising, I mean, to our business, um, I mean, the HR recruitment business, is um, yeah, business portals like LinkedIn or Xing. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, but however, I don't want to deny that in, in the near future, Facebook can expand to a, a recruiting platform as well. But I don't see, I don't see that today, to is be it, honest. It, go ahead. Just, uh, but I think you have to separate between what Facebook is and what LinkedIn is mm. in terms of recruiting purposes. Absolutely. If you look at Facebook, it's more like an advertising for jobs, advertising for opportunities, and engaging with the users, while LinkedIn is more of the headhunting tool mm. plus the advertising as well. So I think, uh, and also kind of coming back to the thing, would you find a baker on Facebook yeah. uh, working in your bakery? Yes, I think so, because Facebook is reflecting the, the general society. It has a, mm. as many bakers on Facebook as you would have accountants. Is, my, is Facebook, let's say Facebook, Twitter, are they still a minefield um, for people looking f um, for work? I mean, are, are you, especially in a HR, are you, going through Facebook um, to make sure that people don't have photographs in their profiles that could be detrimental to their employment. No, we don't oh. do that. There's I none mean, of that going in on. In general, ISTA believes that uh, empowerment is a big thing. Um, so we strongly believe that uh, our employees take care of their employee branding, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, and we cannot help um, everybody in order to, you know... I think it can be a bit of a minefield mm -hmm. if you look at it from the company's um, point of view. If you want to use these um, social um, media channels, you need your employees to be engaged because you want um, prospect employees to engage on a nice level. So. Yeah. Um, if you make this successful, people are able to interact with normal employees, yeah, to just learn how, how it is to work for this company and what their reality in the workplace is. And this requires that our employees are used to work with these kind of um, technology and that they are open in their communication, that they know how to, let's say, interact when people are quite critical about your company. So it's a communication um, culture that you need to establish in your company. And if you haven't got that, and you could go as far as having some social media guidelines or policy in your company, and I think you absolutely require this in order to make it successful. If it's just an HR idea or the boss's idea, we want to be present in social media channels, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. It's an um, all-encompassing cultural approach, really. Do you agree, Georg? Um, I think um, um, it's important to have a program behind it, what to do from a company's perspective, how, I, how the company gets presented, also through his employees. Um, I think most companies, that's at least what HR directors, VPHR people, um, customer of ours um, keep on telling me, are not actively searching Facebook when the, it comes to an applicant or if, when it comes to face-to-face -face meeting before it comes to face-to-face, -face, and that's what they are not using uh, actively. Yeah. What about the notion of um, social media, online um, sources, being able to fight unemployment rates in national economies? You are a great example. I mean, you're providing this marketplace for people to find work. You're, um, one, you know, we could argue that you're actually tapping into a lot of people who would otherwise be unemployed. Correct. I mean, the, you know, the labor ministers of the country <laughs> should be loving people like you. They do. Do they? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we, we have been invited to several, uh, several countries to, to both speak at events, to do trainings uh, for talents in those uh, respective markets. Uh, just before Christmas, I, I spent a week in, in Bangladesh uh, meeting both the uh, ministers, um, 
business people, the outsourcing industry, and kind of most importantly, I met the freelancers working for us. And when you see the impact that businesses like Elon's and our competitors have on families, on individuals, even villages across the across the world, it's, it's impressive mm -hmm. because these people they find opportunity which they don't find locally. They have the same opportunity to have a good standard living as the same as you do in Hannover or in Düsseldorf or any other place in Germany. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of it solves what we the, 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 the search friction in the labor market mm -hmm. really. And many of these I, I counter platforms like ours you're through uh, social media like Facebook. We kind of using Bangladesh as an example again. We have an extremely active uh, community on Facebook's uh, Elon's Facebook page in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you also, uh, all, all four of you, is this a market right now, a labor market, where the people looking for work, can they name their, their conditions and their terms much more easily than the employer? That's the I experience so. we are currently uh, making, absolutely. In terms of money and pay as well? Well, not only in terms of money and pay, but it's also about, about working conditions, culture. They want more transparency. They want, they want more leadership. Um, so overall, I think it's it's pretty demanding nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask yeah. a question? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see any difference in the in the various generations uh, in your company? Um, if you're comparing the, the millennial generation with the baby boomers that is still on board in your company, do they, do they have different requirements, different demands? You mean the youngest? The youngest versus the eldest in terms of compensation, flexibility, etc. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that starts with compensation, of course. Mm -hmm. um, the internet at least provides you with a lot of transparency. Mm -hmm. um, so people know what their role or their position is worth. So you have to have an answer on that. and you cannot simply say, well, we have this and that guideline here and we don't tell you. It's all about transparency. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, yes, it starts with um, compensation, but yeah. we also have the feeling that um, we ne need to retain the younger people by providing them opportunities to grow. And ISTA is a medium-sized company with 4,500 employees, so it's pretty easy to get access to more responsibility and it's pretty easy to get visibility in front of top management. But, I mean, our employees are highly demanding um, a certain level of leadership quality, transparency towards salary, but also, I mean, the cooperation thing. I mean, this is also something, if they don't feel comfortable, if they don't feel engaged and committed, they will probably leave. Are you able to fill every position you have open? No. We are not. What's the percentage of, of unfilled positions that you're dealing with right now? Um, 22 something. Mm. And, oh. and that's where you're, you're actively seeking people to fill those positions? Absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, I think the biggest challenge right now for ISTA is that in the coming five years, we recruit 1,500 people in Europe. And this is going to be a challenge for us in HR. And, and we are currently working on a recruitment strategy. And I can tell you, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. no. The same uh, would go for, for your IT, if I just look at the IT um, side of things. We are probably looking to recruit around 150 highly skilled IT professionals in 2013, but it's quite hard to find uh, those people um, because there, there's almost um, you know, this war of talent um, going on to, uh, around these people and everyone wants to have the best people working for their company. And so you're right, they have demands and um, it used to be quite different in the past, but today we, we need to meet the demands of these people and mm -hmm. it, it's quite a tough market and um, in the last year we actually did meet our recruitment targets because um, we just didn't find all the people we wanted. Yeah, we hear that all the time here in Europe, Georg, is that what you yeah. experience as well? Yeah, absolutely, that's, that's absolutely true and IT is probably one of the, the best examples here. And, and I wonder then, maybe, maybe you guys are not where the solution comes from then, I mean, it, it doesn't have to do with, with countries, with national economies producing people who are qualified for for the jobs that you offer? I think it's always... I mean, you can talk to the politicians from this stage, if you like. <laughs> you know, they've been on the stage. No, but you're right. Time. I mean, it's, it's, it starts... I don't want to say it starts with the environment, the political environment, but I think it's a big driver. Um, and um, 
I mean, sometimes I have the feeling that the, the companies are left pretty much alone in this war of talents and the c politicians are not shaping the right environment in order to get educated people, in order to, well, have transparent taxation models. It's, it's pretty, um, let's say, challenging to recruit people within Europe and, I mean, employ also um, people from Spain or from France in Germany. Yeah that causes always hassles because they want to stay in their social security system and that's getting more and more expensive. Let me, let me, ask, let me ask our audience, people we've got here in the audience, what they believe. Let me just by a show of hands, who do you think is responsible for the shortage of qualified workers right now, <clears throat> particularly here in Europe? Um, if you think the companies are doing a poor job of training, raise your hand. Okay, a few. Um, what about governments in terms of, of education, pushing people? Okay, so a little Some bit more. more. Um, anyone else? Who else is, to, is there to blame for, for this shortage? I mean, because I mean, lots of companies are offering great, great terms now for workers and they can't find the people out there. Um, what else is the problem then? Many I also think, um, kind of moving a little bit of, uh, out of my own sphere uh, with online freelancing, I think uh, companies in general should work more with bringing talents from other markets into to the, to your own destination, to your own kind of on-site location. Um, I've, so I'm, I'm based in Norway, um, in Oslo, a um, country which have extremely low unemployment rates, um, and I also bring. I also hire people from my own team in Oslo, and what I've seen over the last. Uh, my last few recruitings is that I deliberately look for talents that is outside of Norway uh, and bring them to, to Oslo um, because there is more talent available and we have an attractive uh, labor market to offer. Uh, we have attractive jobs and we see the, the response of the job listings that we post on ordinary job boards is tremendous. Um, and the weather is not the hindrance. Uh, the weather is beautiful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you like okay. snow. If you like snow. <laughs> if you like seasons. No, but, okay. I, but, I, but I, think, I think you just have to, to foster a culture internally in an organization where it's actually possible to bring talents from other countries in. Of course, that's not possible in all departments of yeah. the company. You might have to speak German in some parts of the company, but I think in other parts of the company you can speak English. So then you need to foster that culture to to, to bring those people in and you also need to support with relocation. A lot of companies are doing that already but I think you can do a lot more. For example, if you post a job uh, on Stepstone or on Monster in Germany, mm. um, you have people from Romania, from other parts of Europe that is looking into these job boards to find opportunities in Germany. However, if you look at that, those job listings, very seldomly they include anything about support in relocation. Uh -huh. So you need to show that uh, some, some companies do, but mm. very few companies actually do that. You don't but have that expensive. top of mind. It's Absolutely. expensive for a company to pay Absolutely. for relocation. No, but you have to, you have to split between mm. having an expat and having people relocated, bringing a person from, let's say, using Romania as an example, since I mentioned that, to Dusseldorf, using that as oh, an example. Is it's not easy kind of, the, because the truck is not that expensive. No, and, yeah, uh, but yeah. you are mentioning um, somebody from um, Eastern European countries moving towards um, Western European yes. countries. I mean, they used to have a pretty, uh, let's say, um, unattractive social security mm -hmm. system, so it's easy to move them towards the West, but yep. try to move somebody from France or Germany to, I don't know, Romania, mm -hmm. Hungary, or so, then these people request that they stay in their social security system, and that is exactly the point where it becomes expensive. Yeah. And now we're but coming why, more but, into your domain. But, but why? Yeah. Why, is it, see, why is it expensive? Because what you're doing is you're, you're trying to, to put employees in a low-cost country and expect those employees to give up benefits that they would have in the West. Why should you expect employees to give up those benefits? Absolutely. I mean, that's why I, I was just saying that uh, it I mean, doesn't really work. Right. Yeah, it doesn't but work. Because when you talk about transparency, they know how good they can have it in Absolutely. Germany and France. Yeah. Why would they give it up? That's mm. true. I mean, I don't, what, what's so the, the answer in here? The past, in the past couple of years, Romania is a good example. Yesterday, I, t I saw on a TV show 14,000 doctors left the country towards Western European countries mm. because they, earn only, they can earn only 200 euros a month. Right. And, and a, small, a small flat in, in, in Bucharest costs 300 euros. 
right. uh, if you want to rent it. So it's difficult, right? It, but it, if I would be forced to move to Romania, I wouldn't give up my social security system exactly. in Germany, right? Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a natural thing. Exactly. I would like to come back uh, to the question of who's to blame, yeah? Is yeah? it really the educational system or the politicians or whatever? Mm -hmm. I think um, we may have to accept the uh, shortcomings of uh, of both and um, but what are we as a company going to do yeah. uh, about it we can go global yes but in some instances we can't and here i think it's quite important that we realize we have to invest into training um, our people into developing our people and so um, one uh, quite important factor in our strategy of developing talent, of getting the right people in positions, we can't find those experts um, to join us at the top um, of the um, chain. So what we are doing, we employ apprentices in Germany, we, um, we enable them to go to university, etc., and then we move them through positions so that we um, develop talent from within, because that is really the more realistic option at present to fill mm. those positions. So you move gradually up the ladder, and I think that's um, a good challenge for companies, and it's a great investment, and people actually join you for those opportunities, and when you lay them out, uh, when people join you, I think um, it's a quite good um, argument to go for your company yeah, rather than yeah. for another. I think a couple of things can be done from the, from the employer perspective. So one thing is looking for a couple of years in the future, identify your critical job roles, which might hurt you, yes. and then if you see a gap, if you can, can foresee the gap, then you can put some initiatives into place, corporations with universities, whatever, um, to work against the gap. Then the second thing is um, think about the talents you have already, so try to keep them and remain them. That's, uh, that's an important topic. And then to attract um, young people, not the baby boomers, but the, the younger generations. I mean, the, the discussions I've had in the, um, in the past with was, was, um, VPHRs, it, uh, it changed pretty, pretty dramatically. Um, a couple of years ago, everybody was focusing on pay for performance systems and performance management stuff. Now, when it comes to the younger generations, they want to understand from the employer what they are willing to invest into their career. Right? That's an important thing. It's not only money. But why, why are we always talking about younger workers? I mean, if you look at the demographics of unemployed people in the West, yeah. um, most of those people, um, you have a huge section that are between the ages of 40 and 60. Mm. Um, why can't companies invest in those people? I mean, okay. I hear all the time, especially here in Germany, people say once they turn 40, if they become unemployed, that is the kiss of death. Yeah. Oh, that's that's people right. say, oh, no one's going to uh, hire me. And I go to the United States and someone turns 45 uh, and he's like, 45 <laughs> is the new 25. Yeah. Right? I mean, uh, what, is there any way of changing the mentality here in Europe towards middle-aged workers? I, I think it changed already. Yeah. So what, what we see is that the age of uh, my colleagues know better than I do because I don't have the stats uh, out of my mind. But um, people above 50, the employment rates grew dramatically over the past couple of years. Yeah. It, it, it was l way less than 50 percent. It's way up, up uh, 50 percent, mm. for Germany at least. But if you bridge exactly that age group to our social media discussion, mm -hmm. I think it's difficult to reach those people via that channel. So, as I mentioned earlier, it's always a bundle of different recruitment activities and channels you have to, um, yeah, you have to emphasize on. Um, and this plus 55 age group is definitely rarely to find via social media challenges, uh, channels. Excuse yeah, me. but they're out there. They're out there, yeah, but you might, might reach them via employee recommendation programs yeah. or probably print or, let's say, um, online um, job ads, but not necessarily on LinkedIn, Xing, and other business Yeah, networks. I mean, we, we've had some in, in my office, um, people hired in their 50s, and the best thing is that they're never sick. Yeah. They never call in sick. And on Mondays, they never come in with a hangover. And we've had 20 something <laughs> year olds, oh, 30 something year olds. <laughs> I like that. I like yeah. that. <laughs> you know, they always call in on Monday for sick for some reason. Um, any, any questions in the audience? We've got some on the Twitter wall here. Any questions? How about this gentleman right over here? Maybe if we could keep one of our microphones on this side. Hello, right here. Right here. In the middle. 
Yeah. Hi, I'm coming from France and I'm working for aeronautic fields. Uh, the thing is, the, uh, we need uh, about 2,000 workers for the, uh, the big companies doing airplanes in south of France, wow. which is a very nice place to live there. <laughs> yes. And the, um, the thing is, the, um, that's very easy to find top models, singers, uh, football players, because you got all the, uh, the TV shows and they're organizing, you know, all the things, so it's very attractive. I think the main problem in the industry, especially in Europe, it's uh, what we uh, give to the young people or older people. Uh, it's position not very attractive. Nobody, you never heard anything about industry in the medias. Mm. And it's a, uh, maybe industries and European government should think about doing uh, advertising campaign to, um, to give another idea of what is to become an engineer or an operator, build an airplane, doing something like that. Because you can dream doing uh, building an airplane. It's a very nice job, but who's talking about it? Nobody's talking about it. So, is is it an image problem? I mean, is that is that the problem? C could be. I mean, that again uh, again leads us to the discussion of employer branding. Uh, I mean, EADS is probably a good example, and you are aiming for engineers most likely, I guess, and you're competing with nearly everybody, right? Especially in Germany, with with 30, 35 percent manufacturing companies. Um, um, that's a different. That's a difficult topic, and Germany is also a good example because we have so many hidden champions in Germany in the manufacturing space. Not only the big brands like Mercedes and BMW and Volkswagen and everything. Um, and um, there must be an effort. You, companies must put an effort into that. Yeah, to to uh, make people aware that that you have that offerings. Yeah. But I mean, if you read any any newspaper, any magazine, when there are always articles out about starting salaries in the sectors and in the engineering yeah. sector, the IT sector, they always have the highest salaries. So, and it's still not sexy to, to young people going to university. I think that's exactly what you're saying. Is it's not all about money, um, even though you pay maybe yeah. an outranged salary or offer an outranged salary package. Um, probably leads that, that people join, but will they necessarily stay? No, I don't. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think the, the larger corporations, they need to take responsibility and start moving down in the grades at school and really to, mm. to educate them of the future career opportunities. Yeah. Uh, talk about what is it actually to be a chemical engineer and a mechan mechanical engineer and the, the roles and position that we not need today or tomorrow, but maybe we need 10 years down the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. And really make, it, make some interest and curiosity around it, do competition and contests and bring people around to the factories, etc. That is what triggers interest. Yeah. We have seen some bright examples of that in my home country, and I think they're doing uh, companies like Statoil and Tenor. They're doing some great initiatives, really, to to bring these career opportunities uh, and talk about them to really youngsters. I'm talking about people in the 13, 14, 15 years. And old. engineers is actually a tough example because usually engineers are pretty hard to find in Zing and LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So if it's a salesperson or a consultant, then it's probably uh, much more easy to find them. Yeah, but I think what you say is this approaching people at a very, uh, very young age, uh, that, that's quite um, a good recipe for this. And in Germany, there's a governmental initiative that's called Girls' Day. And yes. this is a day when uh, girls um, uh, who, who are in school, they can actually um, go and visit a company. And particularly in manufacturing or in engineering jobs, this is um, the aim of this initiative. And I th think it's quite good to actually lift the lid a little bit and let them see and uh, touch and feel how working in such a place is. And if you raise awareness, wow, that could be interesting. That's the first step towards recruiting someone but should, in but the future. I mean, if you, but if you look at the demographics, I mean, the, women uh, have, sometimes it's easier for women to get jobs. More women are going to university. More women are, are um, graduating you are automatically going to have more women engineers in the future. Shouldn't you be having a boys' day in school? <laughs> because we're always measuring, we're saying we measure girls by what boys yes. do, but all the statistics, the OECD countries show that it's the boys who are failing, it's not the girls. And yet we never talk about the boys, and yet we're all sitting up here talking about a shortage yeah, uh, in jobs where men tend to dominate. 
I think there's a twofold answer. One is that um, girls or women are underrepresented in certain job fields, and that's why it's a good idea to address them specifically for uh, raising interest in a certain job field. Um, but I totally agree with your other point. Yes, you've got to address boys um, just as well. And in our company, we actually made the girls' day a girls' and boys' day oh, for exactly okay. those reasons. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I saw some people out there in the audience um, smiling when I said we should have a boys' day. Is that something that people think is a good idea? Yes or no? What do you say? Yes? See, I think we've got, yeah, there's potential there. Anyone think it's a bad idea to have a boys' day? <laughs> <laughs> the ladies right there in the front. Okay. We got a couple of questions here on Twitter. Um, some years ago, there was a big discussion about party pictures on Facebook. Do you think this is still an issue in HR? Okay. The sins of my past, will they bite me in my employed future? <laughs> Georg? I, I think it's uh, it's funny we discussed it before we uh, before we came up. Um, it depends on the picture actually, but uh, I don't think that employee um, employers actively are searching Facebook for bad pictures or stupid pictures. And I think it also changed over the past couple of years quite dramatically. Is that true? You don't think when when a company is interested in a candidate, you don't think they do a Facebook and a Twitter check on a person? By well, accident, maybe. But oh, come on! You don't think they do a check? No, I, mean, no, not, I, mean, I, well, maybe I, I can, think from legal perspective, they're probably not allowed. But do you do you because, guys check? Um, Rarely, and that's just simply to the fact oh, we don't do it. that uh, yeah. we don't have the resources uh -huh. to do yeah. that. But, but you'd but like to. <laughs> kind of curiosity <laughs> yes. is around there, yeah, definitely. Mm. But also the, the smart candidates are smart enough to actually block their photos. Absolutely, well, so. absolutely. Well, and then what the conclusion was uh, in the discussion we've had, it, it's prob one of the conclusions was it's probably uh, not a good idea to have not a party picture on Facebook because um, you, you will probably uh, end up looking a little bit boring for the employer, right? Uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's it changed. It changed completely, I think. Um, three, five, six years ago, employers didn't know what Facebook is, and they learned a lot over the past four or five years, I think. Yeah. I, I think we were talking about, you know, employer brand from the, the company's perspective, but certainly employees, especially those um, aiming for top jobs, they also have to look after yeah. their employee brand. I and I think you, you would be careful with, let's say, people uh, with pictures that are kind of embarrassing. I think everyone r accepts the reality of um, there's a life outside work and so people party, people have fun, that's, that's fine. But there are certain things that could be damaging to your employee, um, uh, to your employee reputation. Um, reputation. Yeah. And um, I think if you are sensible about this, uh, posting pictures on Facebook or wherever won't harm your career, but no. you don't want to be seen smoking pot or uh, whatever um, in, uh, in pictures. Yeah, that could be damaging. Unless you're you. from Depends a country where smoking pot is legal, legal. <laughs> yes. right? Smoking pot is not illegal everywhere, Christian. Yeah, that's true. Um, most of my social media life is about private topics. How, do you, how are you able to find me if I'm a talent or, or how do I fake it? I'm not quite sure what is meant. Well, I, I guess, the, how, how do you find someone? I guess that's, that's what the question um, means. I guess, but that brings us back to what we said earlier um, about yeah. finding qualified people on social media. I mean, when it comes to active sourcing, I think a good recommendation would be that uh, this person um, creates an own account that's mm -hmm. either on Stepstone or yeah. Monster um, or on the business um, networks such as LinkedIn or Xing, and um, and I think then, I mean, if all the data is completed, you get easily um, approached by headhunters or recruiters or whatever. Yeah. Or I would I would tend to say if he's if he or she is looking for a job, I mean, he could do it the other way around. You could Google and search, and then you will find a lot of stuff uh, where you might apply, right? Mm -hmm. mm, sure. I think in, in social uh, networks, I mean, they are social by definition. It's rather the other way around that um, you as a company would um, present uh, a channel that people find you. And once they found you, you try to engage um, in, in conversations. But um, if it's a business um, network such as LinkedIn or Xing, it could be certainly the other way around. Did you want to say something, Chet? No. Okay. Um, any questions before we wrap up? Oh, one over here. Right here. 
Where is our mic? Oh, we got two over here. Da, da direkt hinten dir. Um, one of the issues you haven't raised in all of the talking is the culture of companies. Um, and as I have got older, and I, I suppose a little bit wiser, uh, as you know, I see differences in companies, and I see you all sitting up there, and it's quite instructive that you each talk about that you need this high-tech talent, um, and I look around the show at people I know who are the types of people that you want, None of them are, wear, are wearing ties or, you know, Armani suits. So, but the culture of the companies that want to employ these people want them to wear a suit and a tie to work and be, you know, performance measured. And when they get in there, you know, the HR person will give them a list, usually two or three pages long, of the company policies, rules. Then you look at the startups. The startups like Google don't have that. You know, it's come to work and we want to make your work day, you know, enjoyable and happy. We want to make you feel valuable. Um, and another point on that, you talked about older workers. I have seen more times than I can remember an older worker, 50 plus, goes into a company and invariably will be. Um, the HR person that talks to them or, or tries to recruit them will be someone, usually a, a young woman, who's half their age, um, you know, and the, the candidate's old enough to be a father, who then can't really... Un, you know, What's they the problem with that, they though? Come, no, but they come from different... They talk different languages, and their, their idea of experience is different. And this goes to the culture of companies and, and how your companies are set up. Um, and I think that's something that maybe you should talk about is, do, do, your, do you as an employer have the right culture to get the people that, that you actually say that you want to get? Okay. Let's, we have this one question here with this um, person and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Let's just get that question and then we'll let you answer both of the questions. <clears throat> Hello. Um, I'm, I'm trying to keep it short. Um, I was asking myself um, how the chances for a lateral entrance, because we have many um, maybe people from universities who didn't study the right thing maybe or didn't study in, in tech business. And I know in America, for example, there is lots of training on the job. So you just have to prove that you're able to learn something but not have to have the diploma, so are there any um, yeah, structures to, to provide that? Okay, yeah, so company culture and lateral moves into different fields. Who wants to take a stab at that? Maybe just one very short one. If I look at our IT workforce, you would be surprised to see the educational background of all of them. So it's um, all over the place and really it's a, a proof in, in, in point that it doesn't really matter what you have done in your past or what your educational background is. You, you can make those lateral moves and companies support this. I, I would like to build on that. That's uh, comparable to ISTA's reality. We have several trainee programs which offers people from various backgrounds a traineeship over the course of two years or so. I think the most important criteria you, ha you have to bring in is the willingness to learn and the motivation to perform. And that doesn't necessarily uh, needs to be a specific theme or topic in your studies. And maybe in terms of um, culture, I think what you described being approached by someone from within HR not matching the culture of people you want to recruit, this is exactly why it would be such a great idea to have um, potential employees talk to employees of the company on mm -hmm. ice level. So, so let them engage in social networks or in other um, 
um, areas because they can tell them what's it like and they wear the same clothes, they have the same background, so let them interact and don't have the middleman, the HR manager in between. Mm. Okay, very good. You got the last word. No, I think um, based on the questions you had there uh, about people that have taken the wrong education, gone in the wrong direction, I think there is an interesting debate going on and that is this responsibility of the school system, uh, which is they have to kind of go back in themselves and actually uh, make sure that the students are actually taking the education that also is in demand. They need to talk about what kind of demand is there now and in the future, not only about what you would like to do, what is your interest, etc. This is the demand, this is the educational direction that you should take based on your skills, but also the demand in the market. Okay. All right. Thank you to all four of our panelists for a really sure. good discussion. We hope everybody finds a job who's looking for a job. Um, it's almost lunchtime. We're going to take a break. Um, and our speaking of Women's Day, our International Women's Day and Future Leadership Summit is going to begin right here on center stage at 2 o'clock. So please come back um, for that. And that's going to wrap up the action on center stage for our part for the global conferences this year. Um, we want to thank you for sharing the week with us. And we want to remind you what we've learned this week. Keep it mobile. Think big data. And don't be afraid to stay in the cloud. All right. Thanks again. <laughs> we'll see you in 2014. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.